Bring in show music, please. This is Squawk Pod from CNBC, and I'm producer Cameron Costa. On today's episode, the geopolitics in the U.S. presidential election. Richard Haas from the Council on Foreign Relations explains the message that America should be sending. If Putin comes away with the sense that U.S. support is not going away, that Ukraine has the ability and the permission from the U.S. to do the kinds of things they did yesterday, then I think the chances of some type of a ceasefire begins to grow. And where are we in the fentanyl crisis? Former FDA Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb explains where illegal drugs are coming from and his ideas for how to stop them. We don't have to rely on these countries to be cooperative. I don't think they're ever going to be fully cooperative and put in place the kinds of stringent measures that we're going to require. We could be taking unilateral action here. Plus, Warner Brothers Discovery, writing down TV by over $9 billion. But first, where the markets go from here. There's some middle ground between a soft landing and a hard recession. I don't know what it's called. It's Thursday, August 8th, 2024, and Squawk Pod begins right now. Stand, Andrew, by in three, two, one, cue Andrew. Good morning. Welcome back to Squawk Box right here on CNBC. We are live at the NASDAQ market site this morning uh, in a rainy Times Square. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin along with Joe Kern. Becky's off today. Yesterday's market failed to hold what was an early rally and the major averages saw those early gains melt away as the afternoon progressed. Down now on pace for its worst week since March of last year. Remember Tuesday, big update until right. the close when it just barely held on with gains yesterday almost got back to some of those yep didn't hold on to them and then lost ground and today down so we're i don't know if we're out of we the just woods. said we just said we're going to be in shaky territory through october yeah but we also started talking about you know that we're going to go from the soft landing is is guaranteed to where you're, you're i felt it didn't you feel it? i felt people thinking recession odds are going up. You know they are, and then now well, Jay- But I also think a lot of this is gonna depend largely on whether you think Jay Powell cuts by 25 basis points or 50 basis points. Well, and again, at 50 basis points, does that say that things are worse? I think it's, you're, now you're putting the cart before, uh, or the yeah, cart before the horse. It depends on whether he cuts 25 or 50, depends on whether it becomes increasingly clear that the slowdown is, is worse than we thought. This is by the end of the decide. This is by the end of the year that JP Morgan's talking about. It goes from 25%. JP Morgan raised its forecast for a US recession. The bank now sees 35%, so a little bit more than a one in three chance of a downturn. By the end of this year, it had been a one in four chance or 25%. And CEO uh, Jamie Dimon told our Leslie Picker yesterday uh, a recession outlook, what they have right now, does come with a lot of uncertainty. I'm fairly optimistic that we have a mild recession, even a harder one, would be okay. Of course, I'm very sympathetic to people lose their jobs. You know, you don't want a hard landing, and so, uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Diamond also expressed doubt uh, that the Fed has conquered its last mile in bringing inflation down. Does inflation really get back to 2%? I'm a little bit of a skeptic on that too. And I, I don't look as much at the, at the short-term data as about you know, the things that are inflationary but are in the future. Deficit spending, green economy, you know, remilitarization of the world. And they haven't really happened yet, but they are going to happen. And they're not deflationary. There's some middle ground between a soft landing and a hard recession. I don't know what it's called. It's, it's, not, it's, it's worse than a soft landing, but it's not a hard recession. And that's where I think that's we are. It's a bumpy landing. Could be, I mean, it could be a mild recession. That's not, that's almost like a soft landing. I mean, it's like almost semantics at this point, but it's almost like a soft landing. If it's like not down a full, like it's two quarters of negative right. growth, which is a funny term in itself, negative growth. But um, if it's less than 1%, both, let's say it's 0.3%, one quarter, 0.6% the next, He's Jamie Dimon saying people lose their jobs. It's not great, but we can handle right. a mild recession that is worse than a soft landing and not like a real recession. And then you got, you know, the thing that we we'll have come up with a term for it. Shares of Warner Brothers Discovery lower this morning. The company reported a nine point one billion dollar write down on its TV networks and missed estimates on the second quarter sales. Now, revenue at its TV networks, which include TNT, TBS and Discovery, were down eight percent to five point three 
billion dollars. I don't know. I don't know what you do. He's good at this stuff. I, 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 is it possible a year or two from now we go, wow, all this needed to be done. Look at what's happening now. Is it possible? It's like a kitchen sink year, uh, basically, with the amount of debt. You know, you buy things like that, the world changes. This is a write down for all, a lot of the cable networks. I don't know what they're worth uh, at this well, point. And, but part of it is that without the NBA, that's what I mean. Yeah, you're going to write the that write down. down becomes a bigger write down. Yeah. And you have the carriage fee issue, which is going to come up for them very soon, which is an interesting one because it's dealing with our parent company, Comcast. In many ways, you know, you have to imagine Comcast is going to say to Warner Brothers, hey, guys, you don't have the NBA anymore. We're going to pay you less for TNT, right? And by the way, we're going to take we're taking the NBA on the other side. So that's what they're saying. That's what they're saying when they revalue the worth of a, of a cable network. It has to do with... It has like to do with carriage fees. Charge, carriage fees. The likelihood of being able to collect on carriage fees and the likelihood of being able to collect in advertising. So, you know, Disney, a quarter earlier than expected, they had a profit in the streaming. So, so I was looking at that. So 47, 40 some million dollars, whatever mm-hmm. it is. Netflix, the king, is, I think, I tried to figure it out, you know, somewhere around 1.4 billion or uh-huh. something in a quarter. So right. is that... 40 times, the, that's 40 times the profits on streaming that, that uh, so Disney, yep. all the excitement about Disney Plus and ESPN and all those things, it's still a, 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 got a ways to go. But is that what we can expect eventually? Well, that's the question. Can you expect that? I don't know if well, you expect Netflix that. Well, how's Netflix do Part it? of that's a global, the question is, can Disney Plus become global at that level? And then the question, but it also depends on families around the world, frankly, subscribing to multiple of these services. Right. And is there just one king or is there a king and a queen right. or is there an entire, you know, who's the court jester? I don't know. Meantime, Google and Meta may have now conspired on ad deals to target teens. The Financial Times reporting this morning that tech giants made a secret deal to target advertisements for Instagram to teenagers on YouTube, skirting the search company's own rules for how minors are treated online. This is according to documents seen by the newspaper and people familiar with the matter. Google working on a marketing project for Meta that was designed to target 13 to 17 year old YouTube users with ads that promoted its rivals photo and video app. The Instagram campaign is said to have deliberately targeted groups of users labeled as quote, unknown in its advertising system, which Google reportedly knew skewed towards under 18s. Meanwhile, documents seen by the FT suggesting steps were taken to ensure the true intent of the campaign was disguised. If true, Joe, this is terrible, terrible news. I say if true because we obviously haven't been able to confirm it and we don't know it ourselves. I imagine more is going to come out about this and I'd love to be able to dig into it to really understand what, what the intent was. Business is war. We know that now. Even these, these nice, I guess I wouldn't mind it so much if they didn't act so um, sanctimonious. So if you, you, know I mean? if you thought they were outwardly like sharks, you would say, sure, they're sharks. They act like sharks. We know they're sharks. That's what yeah, they are. Yeah, art of war. Yeah. Okay. Kill your, you know, just overwhelming force to, to defeat the enemy. But they don't. Right. So woke. They combine that activity. With, what's wrong? With, they do. They combine that activity with this overt, you know, oh, kind and gentle. How about kind and gentle? Is that better? I think they've changed. Elon, I think it's Elon Musk's fault. I, no, I think that Meta is um, increasingly um, unwoke, anti-woke. Two men have been arrested in Austria. This is, uh, was this not inevitable that, that yeah. uh, something like this, when, when you're that high profile, in connection with a suspected uh, attack on a Taylor Swift concert, Austrian police officials said that they were trying to determine if the chemicals found in the 19-year-old uh, Man's uh, su- main suspect's home were for a bomb. He's missing some of the ingredients. Uh, one of these sus- suspects allegedly uh, had pledged allegiance to uh, the Islamic State. Show organizers announced that they're canceling Swift's three Vienna shows, which were expected to draw more than 195,000 people. If you don't have a concert, it cannot be. That's what I said. If they had not let Trump go on stage, that would have never. Ha- if you, if you don't have the concert, if you don't have it, nothing can, can happen. Hopefully and and nothing. you get two guys, 19 years old. They don't have enough. But when you know that it's in the works, you don't know if it's 20 guys. You don't know if it's 
you know, only these two guys, they're amateurs, you don't know whether it's really highly coordinated, just cancel it. But what is weird, Vienna's like the nicest place. It really is, yeah. I, no crime, nothing goes on there um, at all, and it's just odd, that, uh, but scary. In concert venues, those are increasing, you know, the one in Moscow, the mm -hmm. one in, uh, in, in Paris a couple of years ago, frightening. It's frightening that someone 19 years old on the internet can be radicalized to the point where he's got bomb making material in it. So it could be anybody. It could be anybody, anywhere, anytime. It's very dangerous. It scares me a lot. And I will also say one thing, just as we think about all of these things, all of these people who are doing these things seem to be, unfortunately, men between, call it 17 years old and 24, 25 years old. That is the age range in which we have to actually figure out what we're doing here when it comes to dare I say, gun violence, when it says, when, when we think about um, terrorism, when we, I mean, that is the cohort that we need to be focused on because that's what seems to be happening over and over and over again. This is rarely happening with, you know, 50-year-old women, just not. No. Cheese will be next. Next on Squawk Pod, how geopolitics factor in to the 2024 election. Council on Foreign Relations President Emeritus Richard Haas explains the foreign policy that should be front and center. The one story that could hurt things here or affect things here would be the Middle East. And I think if bad things were to happen there, that would probably have a negative impact uh, for Kamala Harris simply because she represents the administration. Welcome back to Squawk Pod from CNBC. Up and Andrew, Q. You're watching Squawk Box right here on CNBC. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin along with Joe Kernan. There's a, a lot going on in the world no matter where you look. The U.S. rejecting Maduro's claim of victory in uh, those Venezuela elections. In the Mideast, we got tensions, of course. They continue to rise and potentially escalate. In Europe, the Russian-Ukraine war is still ongoing and it's all taking place at the same time as this election year here in America that is... Uh, the talk of the town. Joining us right now to give us some perspective and give us some talk of the town, Richard Haas, Council on Foreign Relations, President Emeritus and Centerview Partners, Senior Counselor. Good morning to you. Good morning, Andrew. Which one do you want to take first? And relate it back, though, to the election, because I'm actually very curious how you think the election may or may not impact all of these things, and if it is actually impacting these things. Uh, the interesting thing is foreign policy won't have much to do with the outcome of our elections. I don't think an awful lot of Americans are going to vote on the basis of foreign policy views. But whatever happens here will have right. an enormous but impact. But flip it around. Do you think that any of these things, mm -hmm. whether there's going to be an escalation in the Middle East, <clears throat> the, you know, how you think Putin is thinking about Ukraine, how you think what's going on, do you think any of that is a function of well, the U.S. is, is they're focused over here. We're, we're going to do this over here. Over the next, what, 90 or so days, I don't think, uh, you know, two of the three stories you mentioned, Ukraine is going to have uh, much of any uh, impact. It's going to look pretty familiar. Venezuela, unfortunately, will look pretty familiar. The one, the one story that could hurt things here or affect things here would, would be the Middle East. And I think if bad things were to happen there, uh, that would probably have a negative impact uh, for Kamala Harris simply because she represents uh, the administration. What is your sense of what's going to happen in the Middle East right now? Because there is this sort of rising sense that there's going to be an escalation. We just, thought, I mean, there were reports. Like a sword of Damocles. There were reports on, on Sunday that's hanging that, over, that, or, you know, know, on Monday there was going to be an attack somewhere either on Israel or on Israeli, um, uh, you know, facilities in other countries. I mean, there was, like a three it hasn't happened yet. Even. I think it's still likely. Uh, this was a real humiliation for the Iranian authorities. That's say the stories that keep coming out. You know, this was not an Israeli missile strike or aircraft strike. This was an inside job. They obviously recruited people in Iran, so I think they are really uh, humiliated again is the word. I think they want to do something. On the other hand, they've been getting lots of pushback, including from, funnily enough, probably the Russians and the Chinese. Uh -huh. who don't want to see a, a major crisis right there. And the real issue is then, where would they be? So imagine, quote unquote, they retaliate. Yep. Or where does that leave them? Uh, how do they then avoid Israel's retaliation against the retaliation? So I get the sense that the Iranians are still measuring what to do. And what kind of reaction, if in fact there is some kind of attack, what does the United States do? Well, right now, again, a lot depends upon you know, what, the, what are the consequences of the attack. Right. Last time in April, if you recall, when the Iranians sent, what, 300 drones and missiles, 
the Israel, the United States urged the Israelis, quote unquote, to take the win, respond right. in a very modestly. I think a lot depends on what the Iranians do and what, if any, casualties it, it calls. But the basic U.S. pressure is going to be to tamp things down. We don't want to have a, a big exchange. It would get complicated. I mean, we're hearing, you know, arms embargo, <clears throat> people accusing Kamala Harris of saying that, that there have there been... This, this would be different than, than Gaza. This 100%. would be... We ha we'd have to put all of our uh, resources to back Israel if this was against Iran. 100%. Yeah. You know, Gaza was a discretionary effort by the, you know, increasingly by the Israelis, they, you know, and they were using military force in a way that was causing enormous... I thought you just said everything's going to get tamped down. They're not going to do... We're, we're not going to do something. No, but, but, I, no, but, the, but Israel's going to... You know, if the Iranians hit right. Israel... I think the United States are going to say, yeah, well, well you know, we're going to talk to you about what it is you do. I mean, is this an opportunity for Israel to go after the Iranian nuclear program? Does Israel escalate? Or do they basically, again, uh, do they simply react in a modest way, which is what they did last time? Right. Again, it so much depends upon what the Iranians do and what, if any, effect it, it has. What do you think the current state of Bibi Netanyahu's support is inside Israel? Do you think he's going to still be in that role? Yes. In, in how long? <laughs> Three months, six months, a year, for two first, years, what's well, the... Yeah, elections aren't scheduled for right. another couple of years. He's got a pretty comfortable you know, four-seat or so majority in the Israeli Knesset in the parliament. But there's you know, two things. One, at the moment, he is, he's, he's strong. And he's got five fronts he's dealing with. Think about it. He's got the Houthis you know, in, in Yemen. They've had exchanges. You've got Iran. You've got Hezbollah. You've got Hamas. You've got the situation in the West Bank. Things are percolating in five different fronts and right. venues. My hunch is he stays there for a while. And let me make a, a bigger argument. If for some reason Bibi Netanyahu would have be forced out, have a physical problem, the idea that Israel then is going to go back to being the old liberal Israel of Shimon Peres, that Israel's gone. So Bibi Netanyahu now is as much symptom as he is cause of Israel's mo of political evolution. Will the 2028 election, will there be discussions about Russia, Ukraine in 2020? And the reason I ask, so Ukraine now attacking a, 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 an area of Russia, total Kirk's surprise, yeah. And, and they, so now they got to send, so it's just going on and on and on. Uh, is, if, let's say Trump were to win, w would there be some kind of, you take this, you keep this, I'm gonna, would, some kind of art of the deal he would try to do to, to end this? I, or does it go on forever? Uh, it could go on for a long time at a low level. What I'm hoping is that if U.S. support for Ukraine militarily is pretty strong, if, people, if Putin comes away with the sense that U.S. support is not going away, that Ukraine has the ability and the permission from the U.S. to do the kinds of things they did yesterday, that essentially time is not his friend. And then I think the chances of some type of a ceasefire, an interim ceasefire in place begins to grow. Neither side has to give up its long-term claims. Putin can keep his fever dreams that Ukraine essentially is part of Russia. Yeah. Ukraine can keep its dreams that it wants to get all of its land back going back to 1991. But could you have some Korea-style armistice, some Cyprus-style uh, ceasefire? Absolutely, I think that's possible. But, but the prerequisite of that is the United, is U.S. support for Ukraine has to be certain. Mm. Richard Haas, it's always nice to see you, sir. Good to be here. Are you Thank available? You. Available? Yeah, to negotiate something over there? Oh, I'd love to. I mean, for actually, either, would you work for either administration? The negotiation on that is, is something that I think we, the United States has to push. And I do think there... Would you a, work for either administration? On something narrow, like something specific like that? Absolutely. Interesting. That's public service. I, I agree. Yeah. Totally. Thank you. Up next on Squawk Pod, the geopolitics in the fentanyl crisis. Former FDA Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb on working with Mexico and China to stem the flow of illicit drugs into the U.S. We could be doing much more to crack down on the transit of these precursor chemicals. China, first of all, could be doing much more to do that. They haven't done it so far. We'll be right back. You're listening to Squawk Pod from CNBC. You're watching Squawk Box on CNBC. I'm Joe Kernan. You know that. You, you know that's Andrew uh, Ross Sorkin. And you know Becky's not here. And our next guest is urgently calling for authorities to get control of the fentanyl problem in the United States. That would include uh, targeting and better tracking chemicals that can go into making the drug. Join us now, former FDA Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He's a board member with Pfizer and Illumina and a CNBC contributor. Would, it, would we be trying to control the, the domestic manufacturer of, of fentanyl? I didn't think that was the problem. Or can we exert control globally over, over where it's made? 
Uh, Scott? Yeah, this is about getting better control of what's going on in Mexico. So back in Mexico. about 2019, we started to crack down on fentanyl manufacturing inside China. China took aggressive steps to start shutting down uh, their local fentanyl manufacturers that were shipping finished pills into the United States. They scheduled all those products. They started to um, raid some of their facilities. What happened was a lot of the uh, production then shifted into precursor chemicals that were produced in China and then shipped into Mexico. So the Mexican cartels now take these precursor chemicals, manufacture them into fentanyl, press them into pills, and then those pills get shipped into the United States across our land border. There's still pills coming in from China, so there's still medi medication, illegal medication coming in through international mail facilities and consign um, express carriers, but a lot of it now is shifting into this trade across the border from cartels that are buying these precursors in China and in mixing the fentanyl inside labs inside, inside Mexico. We could be doing much more to crack down on the transit of these precursor chemicals. China, first of all, could be doing much more to do that. They haven't done it so far, but I believe that there's unilateral actions that we could take to impose restrictions on these chemical manufacturers to make it much harder for them to ship these precursor chemicals into Mexico and also put much tighter controls on the tableting equipment. The equipment used, the rotary pill presses used to manufacture the pills, those are made by an identifiable set of manufacturers in China. We can impose unilateral requirements on them if they want to sell any products into any uh, partner nation of the United States, either the U.S. or its partners. They would have to um, agree to impose much greater auditing of all of their sales and put in place pedigrees that would make it easy, easier to track and trace those shipments. Is Mexico one of our partners? Well, look, Mexico has taken steps to uh, impose greater uh, inspections and, and restrictions on chemicals and pill presses coming into that country, but it hasn't worked. Uh, I don't think they're doing everything they can do. We could be putting more pressure on the Mexican government and the Chinese government to take actions on their own. But my point was in the piece that we don't have to rely on these countries to be cooperative. I don't think they're ever going to be fully cooperative and put in place the kinds of stringent measures that we're going to require. Then how do we do we it? We could be taking unilateral action here. Excuse me? Then how do we do it if we, can't, if we just can't put pressure on the... How would we do it? How, how can we make sure that these precursor chemicals don't get to Mexico? Right. Remember, the companies that are manufacturing these chemicals, in many instances, not all, are chemical suppliers that supply other chemicals into legitimate commerce. And the people who make the rotary pill presses also sell those pill presses to the legitimate drug manufacturing right. operations. We could just say, we could work with our partner nations and say, look, if you're going to sell into the U.S. or any partner nation, you have to implement um, track and trace pedigrees. You have to uh, agree to audits of all of your sales. Otherwise, you just can't do business with the U.S. or partner nations. So if we wanted to, we can impose one-way restrictions on these manufacturers that basically closes them off from doing commercial activity um, with any Western nation unless they submit to a much more stringent set of requirements on all of their sales. And I think that that would make it easier for us to separate the illegitimate from the legitimate transactions because the legitimate transactions would now arrive into any country with a much more thorough pedigree on where they were made and where they're going. You got well, I, I just want to go back to the hymns of it all. Yeah. What? Those commercials? Yeah. No, the hymns and hers. Oh, yeah. So, right. And these, these compounds. Yeah, yeah. And how much of a problem that's going to be. Scott, you know, this is something the FDA has not moved on and what your, what your view is. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a big problem. I think FDA should be taking a more aggressive action in this case. Mm. They're basically um, ignoring some of their own regulations. I think it's going to be very hard to impose those regulations going forward if they don't take more aggressive steps here. It's hard to believe that a lot of these compounders now, especially since Lily's drug is off the shortage list, aren't operating in a gray area and maybe over the line. Uh, they can't be engaging in wholesale compounding anymore now that the drug's no longer on the shortage list. FDA really needs to act here if they want to preserve their authorities going forward. All right, Scott, thanks. We'll see you later. That does it for Squawk Pod today. Thank you so much for listening. Squawk Box is hosted by Joe Kernan, Becky Quick, and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Weekday mornings on CNBC, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. To get the best of that TV broadcast right into your ears, follow us here on Squawk Pod wherever you're listening now. We'll meet you right back here tomorrow. We are clear. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.